Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, I'm sure it's been a long day and the last thing you want to do is to listen to a Bengali economist drone on about enterprises of the tomorrow. So, you'll be all relieved to know I have no idea what will be the business enterprises of tomorrow. If I did, I wouldn't tell you because I would be investing in the stock market and trying to make money for, from it. But of course, I have no clue. Because that's really, frankly, your job. Your job is to invest into the businesses of tomorrow, to create them, to take the risk, reap the benefits, and if it goes wrong, reap the non-benefits. But the fact is, it's not the job of the government to be able to tell you what the businesses of tomorrow are. However, we do have a job. And the job is to make it as easy and painless for you to be able to do business so that you can take risks, generate value and be able to engage with a future in which India, of course, will play a very important role in the world. So in this context, what I will do in the next few minutes is to give you a sense of our thinking about the kind of reforms we want to do so that you have a sense of the playing field that you are likely to engage with. So we are now about a little over three decades of markets reforms, right? We have done, we started in 1991 and after wasting about four and a half decades in misplaced socialism, we began to get serious about creating an entrepreneur-based, market-based economy around about 1991. We were forced to do it by a crisis, but anyway, we got going. And the first couple of decades, when we said reforms, we essentially meant liberalization. Remember, words reforms and liberalization, they used to be used almost interchangeably, yeah? Because what were we doing? We were basically rolling back the state from doing the things it should not do. This is rolling back the license permit Raj, yeah? And of course, when we opened up <coughs> the economy and various sectors began to bubble up, we of course very quickly also discovered that markets ultimately function in some space, not in a vacuum. And very quickly, things began to also go wrong. So for example, when you opened up the financial markets, you got the Harshad Mehta scandal and so on. And so, while we began to open up a little bit, with a little bit of a lag maybe, we also began to create the sectoral regulators for the sector. So, th so although SEBI was started in 1989, it's really in the 90s that it got its teeth. You then saw the telecom regulator, the competition commission, blah, blah, blah. So, all those getting set up. And this first round of re reforms generated growth in the 90s and through to some part of the 2000s. But by the end of the 2000s, this generator of growth began to sputter. And it coincided, of course, by 20, 2007 with the global financial crisis. So, in order to keep growth going, um, at that time, the gates of the financial system opened up and there was a period of very high credit growth that happened and unfortunately it led to a lot of misallocation of capital and although it did keep growth going in for a while, it caused the banks ultimately to get stuck with all kinds of bad loans, etc. And by certainly by 2012, 2013, 14, we were being called the Fragile Five. So it was very clear uh, that this particular path of growth would not happen and of course it ultimately led to the banking cleanup and all of those kinds of things. So in 2014, it was clear that the first round of, you know, pure liberalization driven growth had come to a, that cycle had more or less been done. Yes, there were still a few sectors like drones and other things that were opened up later, but by and large, economy had been liberalized, some sort of regulators had been put in place and so on. But you now needed to do a new kind of reform. So what were those reforms? So this round of reforms was about creating the frameworks in which 
this new markets-based economy was supposed to function. So what were those frameworks? Well, the first framework that you needed to create was the framework of macroeconomic stability. So remember that was a time when we were considered the fragile five. We had a history of these, uh, of inflation, um, uh, of course, before that of external stress. So the first thing you wanted to do was to create a inflation targeting system because that is the macroeconomic stability paradigm. And this thinking is now well escoused that even during COVID we did not, you will see, we did not go off kilter and overdo things because we have quite serious about macro stability. Then we began to create a common market. So that's also a framework reform. So the framework reform that we then did was of course the GST. Think of the GST as a free trade agreement that India signed with itself. And I know the introduction of that may have been messy, but frankly, that was the only way to do it. We had to introduce it and fix it ex, and ex post. Otherwise, even today, we would be, have been debating about it. And I think most fair-minded people will say that while this is not a perfect system, it is a radical improvement in the old system that we inherited of indirect taxes, excise, service tax, and, and the entire mess that used to be there, octroi, and all kinds of things. This is a better system. We'll keep fixing it. But this is a framework that is now more or less there. I can tell you your great-grandchildren will be also using some version of GST. Hopefully they'll have got rid of all the kinks by then, but it will be still basically the same framework. Another big framework reform that we did was to introduce the framework for creative destruction, which is the insolvency and bankruptcy code. If you want an economy that takes risks, well, some of it will go wrong by definition. Uh, so therefore, you needed a system which allows for continuously weeding out the things that go wrong. And so these were the kinds of framework reforms that we did. There were others as well, but you get the gist of it. These were big framework reforms. And although we got thrown off a little bit by the two years of COVID, but I think we came out of that reasonably strong. And I, I think it's fair to say that India today has a genuinely well-grounded economy that, you know, faces a, 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 a future where in two, three years' time, we will become the world's third largest economy. So the question is, is this the end? What are we going to do into the future? We did the first liberalization set of reforms. Then we did these big framework reforms. And yes, by the way, one other big framework reform that we did was to create the physical infrastructure framework. The highway networks, the airports, um, and so on. Uh, so we began to create those physical uh, infrastructure framework. Now I'm not saying this is the end of it, but by and large, this round of reforms is done. The, the, the infrastructure part of it will continue, but the other ones are done. So what is the reforms we now want to do? So we are now going into a new cycle of reforms. And some of those reforms we have begun to do. So I'll give you a sense of the reforms we want to do. So all this while when we did reforms, we were doing what is called structural reforms. So we were changing the structure, creating a new framework to the reforms. But the reforms that we are now doing are called process reforms. They're actually quite boring things. They're all the nuts and bolts of the reforms to make the system more flexible. So I'll give you a few examples. You'll very quickly get the idea. Let's take India's intellectual property framework, the patenting system, right? Till 2016, India used to only grant 9,000 patents a year, okay? Last year, we gave 30,000 patents a year. So now that's a huge increase, you'll think, well done. But let me put it in context. The US does 350,000 patents a year. China does, guess, 500,000. 
Okay, now some part of it is out of garbage because it's utility patents, but still you get the picture. A large part of it is good and they're on a different scale from us. So a country like us, I would argue, should be at least doing a hundred thousand. And this does not require us doing very grand reforms that will find the front page of your newspapers. This does not need to be announced in parliament. The changes we need to make are all nuts and bolts, boring reforms and we are doing them. So in the next 18 months, we will put in place a patenting system that will be able to deliver a hundred thousand patents a year. We will not be at the US level, 18 months. So in 18 months you can call me back and ask me questions about this, yeah? We are already, we are already hiring these people, we are already buying the AI machinery for this, we are easing up the processes, dramatically changing all of this. Similarly, we are dramatically smoothening up the process of voluntary liquidation of companies. This is not about, not about somebody who went bust and, you know, insolvent. There are plenty of you for a variety of reasons, they want to shut down a company, right? It's almost impossible to do. It can take you five, six, seven years to shut down a perfectly fine company where against whom there is no cases and nobody really cares about its existence. Why aren't we allowed to shut it down? It's so complicated. So we have already to some extent eased it up and I'm told that the process has already become smoother but do give me feedback if this in another six, seven months it doesn't look clear that the process of voluntary liquidation of companies has not become radically faster. Yeah? And I'm saying we should be fast enough that we should be do, able to do it in a year and a half or something like that. I mean, we need to slow it down because sometimes things come up which, you know, uh, 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 there may be bills outstanding, taxes, etc. But nevertheless, I think 18 months or two years at most should be a reasonable time to do it in. And we have put in place all kinds of improvements to do it. Again, this does not require great economics or debates in parliament, this is all purely nuts and bolts reform. Let me give you another example before I stop. Legal Metrology Act, how many of you heard of this? Good, thank you, at least there are some people who have heard of this. When I very often go into audience and say, you know, I'm going to make some changes to the Legal Metrology Act, half the audience immediately goes to sleep. The reason for this is very simple, please read the act, you will also go to sleep. It is the weights relating, it's the laws relating to weights, measures and labels. Okay. It's literally the most boring act you can imagine. If you ever have difficulty sleeping, pick up a copy, guaranteed 15 minutes. Now the problem is that this set of laws is the source of a huge amount of harassment in our system. Minor infractions in these laws can give you penalty, but even are criminalized to the extent that you can be sent to jail for them because you misspelt the ingredients in the label. And it is very cleverly set up also, it's quite interesting. The very first infraction, you have to pay a fine, but in the second infraction, irrespective of how serious it is, you can be sent to jail up to seven years, by the way. Okay? So now tell you, let me tell you some interesting data in this, which I have written about, so it's not state secret, you can even find it yourself. In the year 20, 2021, or it was 21, 22, I think it's 2021, there were 1.2 lakhs of first infraction penalties that were given. Now guess how many infractions were caught for the second one? Twelve. So I can tell you very easily, 1.2 lakhs minus 12 is the number of cases of rent seeking that must have happened in the system. Huh? Rough estimate, nahi hoga. So we have to do something about this. So again, I have been writing in the press as you will see. The, and I am trying to do something about it and you'll see reports, etc. To begin to get rid of these unnecessary criminal provisions in the Legal Metrology Act. Now, I've given you three examples. I could go on all evening because as you can see, I'm rather passionate about this particular subject. 
but I'm not going to bore you with more and more, but just I'm giving you a flavor of the fact that we are now getting into the insides of the really boring things that make your life as entrepreneurs difficult. One piece at a time. Now, I <coughs> so this is… The, so learn this term, you used to hear about structural reforms, now learn this term, process reforms, you're going to hear a lot about it and I hope you have understood what we are trying to do. There are of course other reforms we need to do. These are also big picture reforms. These are small series of small reforms but there are big picture reforms that we also need to do. And there are two sets of reforms and I'm going to just hint at what they are. But these will require maybe another decade or so of effort. It may not happen. Uh, it will, yeah, and it will require a lot of public debate too. One of them is the reform of our administrative system and the bureaucracy. Right? The Indian ad administration was essentially inherited from the British. It was a system of control. That's what the, our system is set up to do. There's no point in blaming any individual bureaucrat. The system is not set up to deliver service. It's set up to deliver control. That's what the British set it up to do. Unfortunately, after independence, because we opted for a socialist model, instead of unwinding this system of control, we gave it even more powers. So in 1991, we had a bureaucracy that is even more powerful than the one that the British left behind in 1947. Since then, we have reduced the powers of this bureaucracy, but we have not reformed it. Its ability to do damage has been curtailed, but it has not been changed from a control system to a service delivery system. And as I said again, there's no point in blaming any individual bureaucrat for this. The system is just not set up to do this. Right? If you go to a district, who is the, who is the key guy who is supposed to deliver the service to you? The district magistrate, right? Everybody knows this? Now who is the district magistrate in reality? He's the junior most person in the bureaucracy. He's a 33 year old person with literally no experience who is supposed to be there for an 18 months if he's lucky, he or she is lucky in the district and has effectively no chance of delivering the things he or she is supposed to do. The average DM is the head of some 50, 60 committees, right? They're supposed to chair, no, at least 50 or 60 committees. There's no chance of actually even meeting those committees. So naturally, it just flags. What you need to, uh, just as an example, the DM has to be a much more senior person in the system so that they can draw on not just the experience but also on the apparatus of the state to deliver the services they're supposed to do but it's not set up to do that. Same problem happens with municipal commissioners and so on. They're supposed to deliver services but they have no chance of doing so because it's not set up to do it. The other big area of reform that we need to do is to do something about our legal system. Without enforcement of contracts and the delivery of justice, with 40 million cases stuck in our legal system, we cannot become a developed country. And so, there has to be an open public debate about what we need to do about our legal system. This is something the state cannot do in its own, the government cannot do in its own. This has to be done in partnership with the judiciary. But it will only happen when there is a wider public pressure to do this. Because if the government does it on its own, there will be immediate accusation that it's political. So there has to be now public pressure to get the judiciary to reform itself. Of course, the government, the parliament, the wider society is there to help. But ultimately, a significant part of this will have to be done by the judiciary itself. And it will only do so if there is wider public pressure to do so. With that, let me stop, ladies and gentlemen. I hope I have got a flavor of the kind of thinking we have. And hopefully, uh, with your support, we will be able to accomplish some of this. Thank you very much.